right, it is uh, J.C. King, another Least Dangerous podcast. I can't tell you how excited I am here on uh, Texas Country Month continues, or I should say Red Dirt Month. But uh, we have got on the phone with us an amazing singer-songwriter, the man behind the bands The Departed and Cross Canadian Ragweed, in my opinion, the king of Red Dirt music. It's the one and only Cody Canada. Thanks for joining us, man. Uh, thank you, man. That's a, that's a heck of an introduction. I try to set it up right for the people. I try to get, uh, it, damn it, it's exciting. We're talking to you here on the podcast. This is exciting stuff, man. <laughs> well, thanks, man. I saw on your Facebook page, see, this is the weird thing about social media. Are you on the way to Iowa right now? Is that right? Yeah, I played a show in Austin last night with Jamie Johnson and friends. And then right now we're, we're stopped in Wichita to let our driver sleep, and then we play Iowa tomorrow night. That seems like just a hell of a like a hell of a long drive on a tour bus. Like what you've been on those for so long and done them for so long, I'm sure it's just life for you. But what the hell do you do on those things to to, to not go insane? Well, you know, there's a lot of uh, Grand Theft Auto <laughs> video games. We play a lot of that uh, in the front lounge. We don't really have a you know cable or any, anything. That's a waste of money to everybody in this clan. Yeah, you know, we don't watch. We don't watch TV, and um, no keeping up with the Kardashians for the for the road crew. No, no. <laughs> I can care less what the Kardashians are up to. <laughs> rich people whining about being rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so but, just uh, video games and, and, and hanging out. Yeah, in the back lounge is all vinyl records, and we have guitars strapped to the wall, and so we sit around, and write tunes, and play old songs, and listen to vinyl, and you know just. There you go. We've all known each other for years. You know, Jeremy Plato is my brother-in-law and my oldest friend in the world. Yeah. And he, him and I have been playing music for 20 years together. And man, you know, it's the same. We never get sick of each other. You know, it's always the same thing. We can sit and sing the same tunes together in the back lounge. Has it chilled out, night. though? Like when you were younger, I'm sure it was like more partying on the road. <laughs> Are you like drinking wheatgrass juice and talking about yoga and stuff or... And uh, there's none of that. No, it's still it's still pretty it's still pretty high cost out here. Thank you know, God. we 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 go pretty fast. Yes, we have a day off. I've always been this way. A, a day off a day off. You know, yeah. some people like to, to go to the bar and get drunk or whatever on a day off, but I don't know, that's that's never really I've done it every now and then, but yeah. You know, the nights the nights that we play music are the nights that I really throw down. Well, that's, I mean, it's good to hear at least because I get tired. I grew up on rock and roll music, man, and, and bands like ACDC and stuff like that. And to me, it was all about the party. And then, you know, I'll, I'll, every now and then I'll talk to a guy who's been like, no, uh, we just play chess and we, uh, you know, drink a lot of uh, like Nutrisystem. And, uh, you know, I'm like, what the hell? No. What the hell happened to the party? <laughs> no, it's it's still here. I promise you. All right. You know, good like, to hear it. You know, last it's. Last night was uh, acoustic. Well, uh, I mean, not really acoustic. I played with Jimmy Johnson's band. We did a tribute to Waylon Jennings and Hank Cochran, and, and you know, it spilled over into the evening, and we were up till about six in the morning. Jesus! <laughs> so you're waking up right about now. Then you're. This is your wake up phone call. I'm an insomniac. I've been up since about nine. Oh, there you go. So, uh, Jamie Johnson, do you guys ever? Because this is what I would do. Now, when dudes are hanging out, just dudes. I'm assuming you know the guy really well, right? You know, I've, I've recently, he reached out to me a couple of months ago, and I was very shocked yeah. that he did, That he did because you know, I'm such a fan. And uh, he asked me to be a part of this benefit concert. And last night we talked for a long time, and oh, okay. you know, he, wants to, he wants to do more work, more gigs in Texas and stuff. And I told him, you know, just call, call me up. I'm there That's anytime. That's awesome. Well, yeah, I guess you don't. You're right there at the beginning stage of getting to know somebody then, so you can't do it yet. But I'm telling you, once you're really good friends with Jamie Johnson, you got to give him some kind of shit about the honky tonk badunka dunk. It's got to happen at least, at least once. Well, the thing <laughs> is, it's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I accidentally popped off in a bar. He bought everybody a shot of Jägermeister and toasted honky tonk badunka dunk. Holy moly. And and I said, why in the hell would you toast that song? And he said, I wrote it. And I felt so bad. 
I felt so bad because I wasn't prepared. <laughs> but I talked to him about it and he's forgiven me. Well, there you go. So you already did that one then. You can check that off the bucket list. That's I told uh, – I was talking to Mike McClure when I interviewed him, and I told him – um you know, I was making the same joke about writing a song like that, and he's like, hell no, man. I'd like to have at least one song like that because then I could uh, live off that kind of money, you know. So he was he was cool if you can cash the checks at the end of the day, I guess. Yeah, there's something to be said about mailbox money, you know. Yeah. I also want to thank you for turn, turning me on to Todd Snyder. You'd covered a couple of his tunes on some of your uh, previous records, and now I've downloaded basically everything he's he's done. Uh, holy crap, is Todd Snyder awesome, man? Yeah, he. You know, I saw him. <clears throat> excuse me, I got a little bit of the allergy thing. I, no worries. Uh, I met him. I uh, saw him on Conan O'Brien in 1994. I was living at home. I was 17. Yeah. I saw him on Conan O'Brien, and I thought, holy hell, who is this guy? And about a year passed, and fast forward to Stillwater, and I was up there running with McClure and Tony and Jason Bowen and everybody, and we decided to hop in a rented van and go down to Lukenbach, Texas, and see Todd in concert, and it just forever changed my life. Yeah, I'm sure it's like just him and a guitar, right? How he sings, how he approaches life. It just, he's awesome. Yeah, Todd Snyder kicks ass, man. So I would not never heard him, though, if it hadn't been for you. And so I get the feeling, if you know, like, Todd, and uh, because of you, I've also listened to Mike McClure's music. Um, I was going to ask you who else I should be l- listening to. It seems you got a pretty good grip on music, man. You know, uh, we're very fortunate now because there's a guy that my, my wife's been managing, Jeremy and I, for <clears throat> 17 years. Yeah. And she... You know, she has Charlie Robinson, and she has she's had Randy Rogers. She's had all kinds of people. Mike McClure, even. And, um, there's a there's a band called the Gourds. They okay. were around for like 20 years, and their lead singer Kevin Russell started a band called Shiny Ribs about three years ago or so. Okay. And the Gourds the Gourds are now defunct, and Shiny Ribs is on a real fast track. And they're just. Man, it's it's so. This is gonna sound so silly, but the man is a songsmith for one. He's a musician. He's an entertainer. But this is gonna sound so weird. You gotta see it. I mean, YouTube it. It's Shiny Ribs doing uh, "Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls." Oh yeah. A little, a little TLC song. I think that's who did it. Yeah. And he just completely owns it, and it and turned it into his own thing. You know, he does it completely different. The man can. Can take any song and transform it into his own. And if you see one of his shows and you walk out there in a bad mood, then you're the problem. So is it uh, the band called Shiny Ribs, or is that the act? Is it just one guy, or it's, it's a full band? It's called Shiny Ribs. Shiny Ribs, man. Cody Canada, you turned me on to Todd Snyder, so I'll check out. Uh, I'll check that out, man. I'll see uh, see how it, see how it is, man. You won't be disappointed. Um, going from a band that was like so. I know when you were with uh, Cross Canadian Ragweed, I have to ask this, by the way. You know how people used to call it, you've heard this before, CCR? That used to oh, yeah. piss my dad off to no end because he said, there's only one CCR, Creedence Clearwater <laughs> Revival. Did you ever think that or were you <laughs> – did you ever hear that before? Oh, I heard, I heard it a thousand. I still hear it. So, you know, it, we, that's, what's funny is I spent 16 years – well, even more now, this is – I mean, this would have been the 20th year of that band. Yeah. And I I spent forever, you know, telling people that, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of Credence, and I was a fan of Celebrity, but when we named that, when we named the band, it had nothing to do with it. Yeah. You know, it was, it was just three members of the band. Yeah. And it was all of our names combined. And then, you know, there was a, there was a time when we got a warning shot from uh, Creedence Clearwater Revisited. Oh, really? And, and not to sound like a dick, but I was not very scared of that. I was like, <laughs> said, you know, if, if John Fogarty comes calling, then I'm going to probably look, start looking for a lawyer. And then we did <laughs> we did a gig with Fogarty in Santa Barbara, California. And he walked backstage with his drummer, Kenny Arnoff, and Timor uh, Duncan, who, you know, he invented the guitar pickups. The three of those powerful men walked in the backstage. Yeah. And when I when I saw him, I got hot faced and thought, "Oh man, here it is." And he said, "It sure is nice 
to be back together with the real CCR. And I thought, holy <laughs> hell, man. I can't believe I just heard that. <laughs> he also hates Creedence Clearwater Revisited, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> he was very cool with it, you know. And I, That's awesome. I, I breathed real hard. I said, you know, I've, always, I was, I've been worried all day that you were going to say something. I said, we never, ever yeah. advertised CCR. It was just something that people called us, you know, and we never... If it was on merchandise, we shut it down, you know? Yeah. You said you used it using three last names from the members of the band. Well, did you leave Plato out? How do you feel about that? What happened there? <laughs> well, you know, they always called Ragdale. They always called him Ra- Randy Raggy. That was his nickname. In oh, yeah. So it just made more sense. You know, Jeremy, Jeremy was it. If, if you know Jeremy, you know exactly how he is. He's yeah. the most laid back skater in the world, man. Yeah. He knew it sounded good, so he went with it. Ah, uh, cool, man. Was it a, like an interesting transition after uh, things ended with Cross Canadian Ragweed and you started your new band, The Departed? Um, was it a hard transition? You know, like how was it? Because I'm assuming you'd probably never done that before. So what was that like? And switching over? No, I've never done it. You know, I mean, I, 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 I guess we all started it, but. You know, we were all in the very beginning of the ragweed. You know, it wasn't people hiring people or whatever. We just all sat together and played one day and said, all right, we got a band. Yeah. And that's all That's all I ever knew until I was, you know, 35 years old. And so the transition was a little scary. There was about two days there that I was scared. I didn't know what to do. And yeah. I went to, I went to Jeremy's house and I said, what are we going to do? I mean, so we're gonna we're gonna keep playing music. We're gonna find some people that want to jam. We're gonna do it all over again. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're right. We are. And there was a lot of people confused with the first record that we put out, but that it was all all of a, a tribute record to all the Oklahoma people that we knew. Yeah. You know, there was only two people on that album that the world knew. And that was Leon Russell and J.J. Kale. <clears throat> the rest were people that we grew up with and we still know. I, I like those Tom Skinner songs you had on those. Th- those were killer, man. You know, it really easily could have been a Tom Skinner record. Yeah. Uh, just a tri- tribute to him. And and I think that that needs to happen one day. But, yeah. You know, we, we were going to do that with Ragweed, but we were under a contract with Universal Records. And they told us if we put that out, that they were going to shelve it and never see the light of day. So, oh Jesus, we, we didn't want to go through that. You know, they said they wanted original songs. They said these are original songs. They're not our original songs. Yeah, I and mean, it's not like we're putting out a, you know, an album that's, you know, a tribute to Skinner or something. You know, this is a, this is people we knew. These are our friends. You know, yeah, these f- are people that when they have medical issues, bands join together. Yeah, and pay for the hospital bills, and they still wouldn't do it. So we were pretty bummed about it, but we didn't want it to get ugly, so we just didn't do it. Yeah. So as soon as as Ragweed broke up, that was our perfect time to do that record. And a lot of people thought, well, you, you're not writing anymore, and you know, and you're going a different direction. But and I always say, if Ragweed would have done it, nobody would have thought anything of it. Yeah. But you know, now. I didn't want to do, I didn't want it to be like the second version of Ragweed. You know, I didn't want it to be all the same songs and no original. Yeah. Because I thought that was kind of cheating, you know. And for about three years, we only did a couple of Ragweed tunes. Excuse me. And then when Seth James said he was going back to play the blues, I that's when I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start talking to people. And see what they want. And then I talked to this lady in California named Lori. Yeah. Who it will forever, her words will forever ring through my head. I I asked her, I said, you know, you, you've been a devoted friend and fan for a long, long time. And you're from California. Do you miss the tunes? And she said, it's not the band I miss, it's the songs I miss. And you guys, you and Jeremy are still there. So it's really, I'm not really missing the band. I'm missing the songs, and we want to hear them again. Yeah. I said, deal, done deal. And we got, I got home from California and called up the guys and said, man, let's, let's handpick about 30 songs, keep writing new tunes, get ready for the next record. But let's, let's have 
30 songs in our back pocket that if somebody says, hey, we want to hear this, then we'll pull it out and save the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and really now, I mean, it's been four years, and now it's really, in my opinion, settling. This band is finally becoming what it is because now we're in the studio, and we've got 12 tunes that are all our songs, and in our way of doing it, no producer, just us, just yeah. a band making music. And I think once this record comes out, everybody's going to realize what we are. That's awesome. Was We're realizing it, right now, you know, that this band is finally settled and it's, it's us. Was it one of those things that when you first started going on the road, you weren't playing any ragweed tunes? Like, uh, like did, did you find the audiences were receptive or were they like, what the hell is this? Or There was more what the hell is this. Yeah. It was anything. It was, and you know, I, I said Jason Bowling thing earlier. He's, He's one of my best friends in the whole world. I've known him forever. And yeah. When I went out on that, that same California run I was talking about, he said, man, I knew you were going to piss some people off. Like, well, you know, I just didn't, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. You know, I mean, he goes, but man, these are your tunes, <laughs> your songs. Yeah. You play them. And I said, well, I'm, I'm a slow learner. It takes me a while. And, <laughs> but there was there was people that accepted it. And then there was people that yeah wouldn't even. There's still people that won't even hear it yeah. because they won't accept it. And I wish they would. You know, I mean, especially with the next record because the next record is, you know, it's back to me singing all the tunes and Plato singing all the harmonies. And it's ah, there's cool. no outside. There's no outside musicians. It's just the four of us playing music together. Well, I think one of the cool things I wanted to tell you a quick little story because this is where I realized. So I was uh, in Texas in like the 2005, 2006 time period where like you couldn't go anywhere in Texas without everybody talking about the, you know, the, the cross Canadian ragweed band. It was insane. And it was like the number one thing out there. I move up to Kansas for like six years and come back and the whole red dirt scene has changed. When I was in Kansas, 2007, 2008, cross Canadian ragweed played a music festival in Manhattan, Kansas. Do you remember country stampede? Oh yeah. I remember well. I think you played it 2007, 2008, and here's what I remember, and it stuck out like a, I think I've quoted you since then. You guys played two shows on the same day. Mm -hmm. you, you played a main stage show like at three in the afternoon or something like that, and yep. then at night, you went onto the second stage and played like a much longer set, and it was like, there was such a stark difference. I remember hoping that that wasn't your only show at three, because it was like, this just doesn't feel like Cross to me. This doesn't feel like Cody Canada's band. And then we went around to the second stage, and you said, I think you said, if I could play to 500 people any night anywhere in the country, it's basically all I need to be happy. And I was like, holy crap, this is like the coolest thing I've ever seen. Well, that's the truth. You know, I mean, the one thing that I, I'm i thankful for is that cause there were some really, really big audiences for us. But the thing is, is the bigger they got, the, the more I, the more unhappy I was. That sounds that sounds like keeping up with the Kardashians. You know, I, just, I didn't want to. It, it's hard to relate to somebody that you can't see. And if you can't if you can't see everybody's face then it's really hard to get I think being in a band and being in the audience, it on, it's only gonna work if everybody's in it together. Yeah. Like the musicians are with the band, the band is with the crowd, the crowd's with the musicians. You know, it just it works that way. Yeah. Everybody jo joining together when you got four thousand, five thousand people, that's kinda hard to do. Yeah. I've only seen a few bands pull it off. I'm a huge Pearl Jam fan, and when they play for those massive crowds, I go every time in Texas. Excuse me? It works when they do it? Yeah, it, it works. It works, you know. And, but I, when it's like 500 people talks, I mean, that's the best to me. Yeah. That's everybody's intermingling and talking and buying each other drinks and well, it's just a cool vibe, man. We're smoking weed. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I will tell you, um... That uh, what I thought, and maybe I'm, tell me if I'm wrong in this, but I'm going to say kind of like why I thought it was weird watching it on the big stage. I felt like you weren't as into it playing like in between, like, I can't remember, but playing like in between like Terry Clark and Tracy Lawrence or something, but it didn't feel like you. And I don't think you were even that into it. And when I saw you later that night, it was like, okay, this is my crowd. This is my audience. This is where I'm supposed yeah. to be. 
Well, you nailed it. Yeah. I mean, I, the one thing that I always had issues with the record label was stop calling us country because we're not country. We're, you know, we may have country music tendencies, and we might, you know, we were all influenced from from Merle Haggard to the Who, you yeah. know, and or from Little Feet to you know Slayer. You know, I mean, it was <laughs> everywhere, and then. But don't I, I kept telling them don't advertise us as country because the people that like this music really don't like country music. Yeah, they have a completely different outlook on what country music is than we do. Yeah, <clears throat> when and you ha- playing between acts like that, nothing against those people. Yeah, it was just it was just that square peg and a round hole thing. Yeah, me. but when we got to do our own thing, it's like okay, would you play how long? Two hours max. Then we're then we're on. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, it was uh, it was definitely cool seeing it like that, and I could tell that. It, I wondered if you ran into a lot of that when kind of things had hit their peak, and you had the uh, the major label deal and all that stuff. If they were trying all the time to keep, you know, saying, "Well, you got to sound this way, or you got to fit into this mold," like if that was a constant, and it sounds like it was a constant struggle you were always having, trying to be your own artist. It was, and you know, now we've had a couple of people mention, you know. Hey, there's a record label, a company that's talking about you guys. Like, man, thanks, but no thanks. You know, we already yeah. did that, and nowadays you don't need it because we learned, and we learned the hard way, and we were warned by our friends. You know, be careful how you do this. Yeah. And so where we are, we're very careful. You know, and we never did anything that we didn't want to do. Yeah. And that was the thing that we told the label is like, you know, you can you can sit and and tell us to do this and do that and change this and change that, we're going to smile and nod our head and do what the fuck we want to do. Sorry. <laughs> no, it, it's a podcast. Go for it. <laughs> no, okay, right on. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> well, but you know, that now they're trying to, they've tried to, we've had label people reach out and say, you know, we don't, we don't need you. Yeah. I mean, why, in my book, you know, I always talked about turning my radio off years ago. Yeah. And I realized that I did. I still talk about it, but now I realize that I actually did turn my radio off about seven years ago and stopped listening to the radio. And now I listen to my hometown Americana radio station and take it with me on my phone. And then I listen to satellite radio because I, I'm the driver. I'm the DJ. Yeah. You know, and, and Pandora's and all that. And, you know, and people bitch about not getting paid through Pandora's and not getting paid through... I heart and you know, whatever. You know, quit complaining about it. You're getting, you're reaching thousands of people. Yeah. Just because you're not getting your twenty-seven dollars, or whatever it is you're paid for, however how many spend, it's not really that much. Well, you know, gig. You have to go gig. Yeah. You get out and play your shows. And if there's, if Pandora, I mean, it reaches all over the all over the world. Yeah. You know, I mean, what do you what what do you have to bitch about? You know, you're 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 further along. Twenty five years ago, people would be killing to get that kind of exposure. Well, an independent artist now. I mean, it's the reason that I've got a podcast now. I was in the radio game for a long time, just doing straight country DJ work, and um, it, it just became where you had like five seconds to talk between a song, or you couldn't do, you know, long form, actually interesting interviews with people like this. And so I was like, I want to do something on my own, build an audience, and because of the internet, I can go out and build an audience and do my own thing. And you can do the same thing now with your band, where you don't need any labels anymore, really. You can build it because of the internet. Once you have the audience, then you can figure out how to make money off of them. Yeah. Yes, it's really it's really in our hands. You know, it's... I, I say in our hands, not personally ours. It's, it's, it's everybody. Yeah. It doesn't belong to one single person, you know. You have a good manager, you have a good band, and then you become friends with people like yourself. Yeah. And people like, the and, you know, it's, it's serious. And then you all work together. I talked to Dallas Wayne from Outlaw Country last night for an hour. Yeah. And, you know, and he, he said, man, we play people's MP3s. We play people's home recordings, phone recordings. You know, we just want to spread the word. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. I mean, uh, two quick questions, and then I'll let you go because I don't want to take up all your time. I know you're kind of off work now. Um, I wanted to ask you, that with the – with the old band, are you, you know, I don't know how things ended up. It's kind of a little bit mysterious, but uh, is everything cool with everybody now, or did it end like uh, like the Eagles, where you can't, like Joe Walsh and Don Henley won't talk to each other anymore or something? 
You know, I, I've talked. I've talked to the other dudes. It, uh, we miss it. And, you know, it wasn't as great as we wanted it to end. Yeah. You know, nobody is. You know, we can we can be in the same county. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I got you. you... It's all. It's all good. It's always weird. It, wh- anytime anything ends, though, I mean, an ending by its nature can't be entirely, <laughs> you know, uh, seamless. So it's stuff is bound to ha- happen, you know. Well, that's why we told it. You know, we didn't want everybody. We didn't want to say, "Hey, the band's breaking up." Yeah. Because automatically people think negative, and yes, there were some negative things, but not as negative as people were letting on. Yeah. You know, I've had, I've heard rumors from everything where. I was offered solo <clears throat> contracts that I was cheating on my wife. I've heard all kinds of shit. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, and honestly, it's always going to come down to be my fault somehow. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what, uh, uh, the last thing I want to know is what do you have lined up? You're working on the, the new record now. What can people expect in 2014 with The Departed? What's going on there? Well, we are actually in the middle of recording right now. I think we're a little further than the middle. And, um, uh, it's all us. All of you know, we we're doing it as stripped down as possible. Stripped down meaning instead of doing seven guitar parts, it's two. You know, and instead of five or six piano parts, it's two. You know, it's exactly what you hear live. Yeah. And it's it's all our music. And right as of now we don't have any you know, I'd like to put at least one cover on the record just to let people know what we did. Yeah. And it's fun to do that. It's fun to play those songs. But right now, you know, we're rolling ahead with just 12 songs that are us. Cool. So it'll be out october is what I'm thinking. Cool. So October, new album from The Departed. Uh, I'm going to tell you the, the coolest thing about talking to talking to you, Cody, is that, that um, you can tell. I can always kind of tell, but it, definitely in talking to you, I can really tell that at the end of the day, uh, I think this is what people appreciate the most about you. You're a real no bullshit kind of dude. You know, you'd rather, like I said, you're not a Kardashian type. You're more about the music than anything. And um, it's just awesome getting to talk to people that still feel that way about their art, you know? Well, you know, a long time ago when I was in Stillwater and watching all these bands come through, my wife and I were kind of scouting these bands and bringing them to Stillwater because we dug them and we thought everybody else would. And it worked, you know, for basically all those bands. Yeah. But there were some people that were assholes. Yeah. I, I told her, I said, man, if anybody ever in our organization is a bigger dick as those people, then we need to have a serious talk. Yeah. Said, I mean, this is this is music, you know, it's whether it's negative lyrics and crunchy guitars or it's peaceful folky yeah. folky stuff, you know, I mean, be nice to people. Yeah. Because they don't have to come to you. There you and, go. It's just easy. It's easy. It's easier to be nice than it is to be an asshole. Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's a, that's the perfect stamp. It's easier to be nice than it is to be an asshole. Are you a Texas? Uh, are you in Texas now? You live in Texas or you live in Oklahoma? I live in New Braunfels, Texas. My okay. wife and I on that May third ninety nine tornado, that first Moore tornado. Yeah. She, she's a California girl, and she was so terrified that she was she was developing a um, anxiety disorder yeah. so i said man <laughs> if we're gonna have kids and do this you know be with each other forever then i'm gonna get you out of here so we moved we moved south you know jason baller moved down to austin stony moved down there and we thought you know let's keep this all together and let's let's move you know and it wasn't nothing against oklahoma it just i want i wanted to go further south so I, I didn't have to worry about throwing my kids in a hole you know yeah there you go is, uh, is it, this will be, I promise, this is the last question. Is it douchey, though? I've been a Texan my whole life, and until I moved to Kansas for six years, I didn't know the term red dirt existed. I called it Texas country and was a real douchebag about it, like a lot of Texans are, you know? We make our wa- we make our waffles the shape of our state. So uh, is it still legitimately okay to call it Texas country? You know, I bet the, I'll tell you the, what should be in the dictionary. Yeah. Red dirt music is Oklahoma music. That's his music, except his music. And luckily, the two have combined forces and are sharing audiences together. But the late but Bob Childers called it Red Dirt Music because it was as, the music was as pure as the dirt was red, is what he said. And that's why Bowen and I started telling everybody, what is it? It's Oklahoma music, but you know, they call it Red Dirt. 
<laughs> That's the final it's verdict. Kind of the same, but you know, to put it in a dictionary form, Oklahoma music, red dirt. So there you go. The Oklahoma boy calls it Texans are douchebags. Get over it. <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, man. It's been a blast. You got me. Have a good day. I'm going to go watch Godzilla. There you go. Good luck. Enjoy that. Bye. <laughs>